Hello, and welcome to this interprofessional education experience. My name is Kristen Kasilik, and I am currently Assistant Professor of Mental Health Law and Policy and Faculty Affiliate of the Louis de la Part Florida Mental Health Institute at the University of South Florida. Prior to my appointment at USF, I was Assistant Professor of Rehabilitation Counseling at the University of Texas at El Paso. The Paso del Norte region and UTEP continue to hold a very dear place in my heart. During my time at UTEP, I collaborated with the Opportunity Center for the Homeless on several projects, including work in the area of understanding barriers and facilitators of employment for people with lived experience with homelessness. Today, I will talk a little bit about what I have learned through the literature and through my experiences working with the Opportunity Center for the Homeless and with people with lived experience with homelessness about providing quality care to individuals with lived experience with homelessness. Before delving into consideration for providing quality care for individuals with lived experience with homelessness, it is important for us to understand who we are talking about when we use the term homeless. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides a couple of definitions of homelessness, including an individual who lacks housing without regard to whether the individual is a member of a family, including an individual whose primary residence during the night is a supervised public or private facility, for example, shelters, that provides temporary living accommodations, and an individual who is a resident in transitional housing. A homeless person is an individual without permanent housing who may live on the streets, stay in a shelter, mission, single room occupancy facilities, abandoned building or vehicle, or in any other unstable or non-permanent situation. This part of the definition of homelessness is from Section 330 of the Public Health Service Act. An individual may also be considered homeless if that person is doubled up, a term that refers to a situation where individuals are unable to maintain their housing situation and are forced to stay with a series of friends and or extended family members. In addition, previously homeless individuals who are to be released from a prison or a hospital may be considered homeless if they do not have stable housing situation to which they can return. A recognition of the instability of an individual's living arrangements is critical to the definition of homelessness. More information can be found on the National Health Care for the Homeless Council webpage. Homelessness has also been defined by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, as either one, an unaccompanied homeless individual with a disabling condition who has been continuously homeless for a year or more, or two, an unaccompanied individual with a disabling condition who has had at least four episodes of homelessness in the past three years. In its definition of a homeless person, HUD defines the term homelessness as a person sleeping in a place not meant for human habitation, for example, living on the streets or living in a homeless emergency shelter. HUD releases an annual homeless assessment report to Congress every year. The report is released in two parts. Part one provides point in time estimates, offering a snapshot of homelessness, both sheltered and unsheltered, on a single night. The one-night counts are conducted during the last 10 days of January each year. The point-in-time counts also provide an estimate of the number of people experiencing homelessness within particular homeless populations, such as people with chronic patterns of homelessness and veterans experiencing homelessness. The figures I'm sharing with you here are from the first part of this report. On a single night in 2017, 553,742 people were experiencing homelessness in the United States. That is a 1% increase from 2016, when the estimate was 549,928 people experiencing homelessness. A majority, or 68%, were staying in emergency shelters, transitional housing programs, or safe havens. 32% were in unsheltered locations. One-fifth of people experiencing homelessness were children. 70% were over the age of 24, and 10% were between the ages of 18 and 24. Between 2016 and 2017, the number of people experiencing homelessness declined about 3%. 
Declines were composed entirely of people staying in sheltered locations, which declined by 5%. Homelessness increased among people staying in unsheltered locations by 9%. I'm going to invite you all to contemplate this question for a moment. What do you think is the leading cause of homelessness? Take 30 seconds to think about this, and then we will move on. The population most at risk for homelessness are those people who have experienced a job loss. How does this compare to what you estimated to be the leading cause? Due to stereotypes surrounding homelessness, people may assume that most people who are homeless are experiencing homelessness because of drug or alcohol use or incarceration. However, in reality, the population most at risk for homelessness are those who have experienced the loss of a job. These data are from the 2016 Annual Homeless Assessment Report and reflect the statistics specific to El Paso shelters. As you can see, the majority of El Pasoans experiencing homelessness in 2016 were either in emergency shelters or transitional shelters. Now that you have a little background on homelessness, let's take a look at some recommendations for providing health care to the homeless. In 2014, Dr. David Menes and Dr. Muniza Khan of the University of Tennessee Health Science Center published a paper in the American Family Physician titled Care of the Homeless, an Overview. In this paper, they describe the initial approach to providing care for people with lived experience with homelessness. This involves outreach to identify people who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. Once outreach is complete, the priorities for the first visit, according to Maness and Khan, should include establishing trust and rapport and exhibiting empathy, constructing a respectful, warm, non-threatening and non-judgmental environment, and they advise that providers first treat symptomatic problems that can be addressed with simple guidance and will have a visible impact on the person's life. This will help to develop trust. In subsequent visits, they suggest that more complex issues can be addressed once trust and rapport have been established. Such issues may include identifying emergency contacts and discussing individuals' more challenging social, medical, mental health, and or substance use problems. In this article, Manas and Khan also point to several logistical considerations that need to be taken into account when providing care for people with lived experience with homelessness. There are many complexities of treatment planning with individuals who are homeless, including the fact that a lack of dependable communication and transportation make referrals, scheduling follow-up appointments, and monitoring laboratory tests and response to therapy challenging. Patient advocates or case managers can help in this area. And they state that goal setting, short term markers of success, and regular progress reports from clinical staff may assist with the biggest challenge of disease management. In terms of clinical and medical considerations in working with this population, homeless individuals tend to face the same health complications as the general population, however, at a higher rate, meaning that they experience health disparities. Sources of disparities include long-term exposure to disease agents, overcrowding, unsanitary conditions, poor nutrition, sleep deprivation, violence, physical and emotional trauma, sexual abuse, and weather extremes. Common clinical and medical conditions experienced by individuals who are homeless include cardiovascular disease, dual diagnosis of mental illness and substance use disorder, Cognitive Disorders and Traumatic Brain Injury, TBI. In fact, TBI is estimated to be more than five times the rate in the general population. Injuries and violence, preventive health issues such as infectious diseases and sexually transmitted infections, skin and foot problems, and exposure weather-related conditions are also common medical conditions among people who are homeless. 
This table from the Menes and Kahn article lists the logistical and clinical considerations, examples of these considerations, and recommended interventions aligned with these considerations. This is a useful tool for providing health care to individuals who are homeless. Mattis and Kahn recommend care be provided to individuals experiencing homelessness via an integrated and multidisciplinary approach by a team of healthcare personnel knowledgeable about the unique challenges faced by homeless persons. They suggest using a patient-centered medical home model in association with outreach services at multiple sites with ready access to secondary tertiary care, convalescence and respite care, community resources, and local agencies for housing, employment, and legal assistance. The ability to care for medical and psychosocial needs in one place and the U.S. policy of housing first are key components of service provision for individuals experiencing homelessness. Health care for the homeless is a model of care that aligns with what Maness and Khan recommend. According to the Healthcare for the Homeless website, which contains a plethora of useful resources and training and technical assistance courses that I would recommend exploring, Healthcare for the Homeless, the HCH program, started in 1985 through 19 demonstration projects funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Pew Memorial Trust. The intention of these initial projects was to determine if a specialized model of delivering services could improve the health of individuals experiencing homelessness. Federal funding for more projects began in 1987 through the Stuart B. McKinney Homeless Assistance Act. In 1996, HCH projects were consolidated with community health centers and other primary care projects administered by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA's Bureau of Primary Health Care. By law, HCH projects receive 8.7% of appropriated health center funds. There are now 208 HCH projects nationally, at least one in every state, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Like other health centers, HCH projects are community-based and patient-directed organizations that serve low-income populations with limited access to health care. Each is located in a medically underserved community, is a nonprofit organization or public entity governed by a community board, and provides comprehensive primary care as well as supportive services, such as education, translation, and transportation, that promote access to health care. All services are provided on a sliding scale with fees adjusted based on income and the ability to pay, and no patient may be turned away due to inability to pay. Unlike other health centers, HCH projects are required to provide substance abuse treatment services. HCH rests upon the notion that there's a relationship between health, housing, and homelessness. Again, from the HCH website, poor health, which includes illness, injury, and or disability, can cause homelessness when people have insufficient income to afford housing. This may be the result of being unable to work or becoming bankrupted by medical bills. Living on the street or in homeless shelters exacerbates existing health problems and causes new ones. Chronic diseases such as hypertension, asthma, diabetes, mental health problems, and other ongoing conditions are difficult to man manage under stressful circumstances and may worsen. Acute problems such as infectious diseases, injuries, and pneumonia are difficult to heal when there is no place to rest and recuperate. Living on the street or in shelters also brings the risk of communicable disease such as STDs or TB and violence including physical, sexual, and mental violence because of crowded living conditions and the lack of privacy or security. Medications to manage health conditions are often stolen, lost, or compromised due to rain, heat, or other factors. When he, people have stable housing, they no longer need to prioritize finding a place to sleep each night and can spend more time managing their health, making time for doctor's appointments, and adhering to medical advice and directions. Housing also decreases the risk associated with further disease and violence. In many ways, housing itself can be considered a form of health care because it prevents new conditions from developing and existing conditions from worsening. 
We will now watch a short video on the client perspective of HCH by Helena Weathers. A little bit, a little about, bit about my experience, experience with helping for the homeless. Um, um, as you said, said I, I, I first came in 1997. I was, I was homeless. I was sick. I was, sick. I was, I was addicted, addicted to drugs, drugs and alcohol. And alcohol. Um, you, name you name it, it I had it going on with me. With me. Um, um, I, I, I really forget how I was actually came upon health care for the homeless, but it was, but it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Um, if it wasn't for the, the programs that I got involved in there, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, honestly. Um, <clears throat> when I got there, I didn't know what to expect. Um, like I, like said, I said, I was suffering from mental illness. illness. I, wasn't I wasn't being treated, treated for it. Um, I didn't understand it. Um, it, was it was just real difficult, difficult for me to grasp hold what everything that was going on with me. So, so I did I ask for help for my mental, mental illness at first. That, that I wanted to get that under wraps because, because I knew if my mind wasn't right, right it wasn't nothing else was going to be right. right. So I, so did, I did that, that. Uh, I got a therapist, therapist and psychiatrist, and, and that went well. well. But, then but then I found, I found out they had other services available for me. For me. I, just I just went for my mental health. health. That's, That's the only reason why I went. went. But, but come to find, find out, out, they had, they had medical, they had, they had addictions. addictions. They had they everything that I needed to get myself back together in one building. In one, in one building. building. And, that's and that's the best, best part, part about health care for the homeless. Everything, Everything is, located is located in one spot because had it not been in the condition that I was in when I first got to health care for the homeless, I wouldn't have gone to four different places for the treatments that I needed and got from health care for the homeless. Um, I, I just wasn't there yet. Um, so... It, it, it not only works for me, it works for a lot of people. people. Uh, if, if you put, you put some work into it yourself, um, um, but they, they have everything there for you. They were, they were so, so compassionate. And I, and I mean, I gave them the hardest time I could ever think of giving anybody. I fought tooth and nail for them, them to not, not get, get me well. well. That's, That's how, how sick, sick I was. Um, but they never gave up on me, not once. I would relapse. Stay away, Stay away for a while, while come back, back and, I and I still got, got the same, same compassion as I came there the first time. time. It, was it was unbelievable how compassionate these people are at healthcare for the homeless. They, they actually care about, about each, each and every individual that they deal with. Deal with. Um, I just, I just can't say enough about, about them. them. Um, they helped help me get into shelters. shelters. I would I mess that up. up. I, I come, come back, back and they got me in the more shelters. shelters. Um, <laughs> they, just they just stuck, stuck by me through everything. everything. No, matter no matter how, how much I tried to get away, get away from, from the help, the more, the more determined I was to get away from it, the more determined they were to help me. And, and I just can't say enough about help here for the home. Thank you. Locally, the agency San Vicente Family Health Center, where some of you may have the opportunity to volunteer, visit, or complete a practicum or internship experience, is a patient-centered medical home and HCH provider. I'd encourage you to explore their website. You'll note that they actually have a clinic on site at the Opportunity Center for the Homeless. To give you a very brief background on the Opportunity Center for the Homeless, or the OC, the OC is a recognized 501c3 tax-exempt organization. The OC was opened on January 3, 1994 by Ray and Lily Tolius. The purpose of the Opportunity Center for the Homeless is to help those that can, can to move forward and for those who can't to protect them. The center strives to create a system of care for the most needy among the population through the development of transitional and long-term supportive housing. Ray Tullius was homeless when his sister suggested he attend UTEP to become a social worker. 
He earned his bachelor's degree in social work from UTEP in 1990 and his master's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Austin in 1993. Before he and his wife, Lily Tullius, opened the Opportunity Center in 1994, there were only five homeless shelters in El Paso with the capacity to serve 450 people and more than 1,000 people living on the streets. Located in downtown El Paso, the Opportunity Center for the Homeless is the largest homeless shelter system in West Texas and Southern New Mexico, with two shelters, one for men and one for women, and seven residential centers for older adults, people with mental illness, veterans, families, and other homeless populations. Any person can receive services by walk-in or referral 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Thank you.